Let us now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 9 to 10. Our God is the God of grace. 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 Um, he's the God of grace, or he's the gracious God. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says that because he gives grace, and this is where we need to pay attention. He gives grace, but he gives grace to those whom he wants. So we have to pay attention to that. Many people like to just hear that and then just run with it, but that's not the end. That's not all there is. He gives grace to whom he wants. That's the part that we need to pay attention to. Uh, Exodus 33, 19 says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, meaning I will not have mercy on whom I don't have mercy. I will not give grace to whom I do not want to give grace. And we cannot complain about it because that's who God is. God is the God of grace who gives grace to whom he wants. And he gives more grace, as James chapter 4, verse 6 says, to those who know his grace. Who does he give more grace to? To those who know his grace. So there is condition to his giving and his giving more and more. So it's to whom he wants and to those who have already received his grace and know his grace. Knowing his grace, being experiencing his grace, being moved by his grace and appreciating and loving and, and just cherishing that grace and growing all the more in the knowledge of his grace, he gives them all the more. That's who God is. So having faith in such a God is to boast of the fact that I have received grace, as the title of today's sermon goes. What have I received? I received grace. So it's to boast that. And it's not boasting like how smart I am, how beautiful I am, how strong I am, but it's to boast that I have received the grace of God. And for such a man, now he needs to live this life, life according to such a confession, and that's to begin his life with grace, to live all the days of his life in order to end with grace, to begin and end with grace. Colossians 1, 6 says, Since the day you heard, heard it, meaning God's grace, and truly understood God's grace. So just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So from the day you heard God's grace, from the day you received God's grace, you are to now live by his grace in order to end your life with grace. So beginning your life in Christ by his grace to end with grace, to go from grace to grace, we need to keep that grace looking forward to the grace that he will bring in the end. First Peter 1.13 talks about that. When the Lord comes back, he will bring with him his grace. So those of you who understand, say amen if you think you know this grace. Amen. Because this grace is so special. What kind of grace? Amazing grace. Yes, it's called amazing grace because there's no other word to put to it because it is amazing. Those of you who know that, then you ought to be growing in the knowledge of that grace, looking forward to the grace he will bring in the end. It's not to say it's a past event and I move on from it. I think about it once in a while and I live sometimes being moved by it and other times not, but rather being moved by it all the days of our lives and each day getting grow, growing all the more in the knowledge of his grace so that in the end I will receive the grace he brings. So the Bible is really about the grace of God beginning uh, to the end. Uh, if you look at all the epistles that the apostles wrote, especially those of uh, the apostle Paul, epistles being the letters that he wrote to the churches and Christians at this time, the opening of all the epistles, like whether it's the, book, uh, the books of Thessalonians or Timothy, or Ephesians or whichever, as he was writing, he would open up his letter saying, Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This phrase or the sentence is repeated every letter. Grace and peace to you from our Father, our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So all the letters begin with the grace and peace of God. And interestingly, the last book of the Bible. Anyone know which book that might be? The book of Revelation, ending on chapter 22, verse 21. The last sentence is, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So it begins with grace and ends with grace. So what is grace? Um, 
Anyone named Grace in this room? And it's like, yeah, that's me, Grace, yes. Grace is a very popular name, and it's a um, popular name among Christians. Um, because grace, it just brings smile, right? Because grace means gift. It is something that's freely given. Um, it's freely given from God to mankind. It's freely given not because it's worthless, but because it's too costly to pr put a price on. It's been given without a price. So I think uh, some of the smart, calculative, maybe capitalist advertisers took this idea and made into MasterCard commercial, priceless, right? So they do, I don't know if they still have it, but for a while they had this campaign like priceless, priceless. Like, you know, you can, you can price a diaper, you can price baby food, you could price uh, baby clothes, the crib. They're all like $100, $50, $75, $300, blah, blah, blah. Holding your first baby in your arms, priceless. Right? So you could put price on objects. And you can invest a lot and spend a lot, but to hold your own baby in your arms for the first time, that's priceless. That, that. So th what they're selling is obviously the idea right, of uh, this having that experience, and there you cannot put a price on it. So priceless, because it's too costly, he gave without a price. That's what grace is. So as Christians, we must know his grace. We must receive it. And we have to put every effort to keep it. Like, without knowing, uh, growing in the knowledge of his grace, we can lose it. We can fall short of it. Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it. This is like towards the end of the book uh, of, the, uh, of Hebrews. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Meaning, you can fall out of, fall away from the grace of God. The book of Hebrews written to the Christians at the time, not to non-believers. So the warning is for the Christians, put every effort to not fall away, fall short of the grace of God, because you can if you don't put effort. So you need to know and grow in the knowledge of his grace. Now, how did God reveal his grace to us? He had the greatest gift in mind, in plan, from the beginning. But for men to be ready for that, um, God gave in stages. You know, when you uh, go to like three-course meal or five-course meal restaurant, they start with appetizer, right? So it's called appetizer. Um, where some of us, we just go, no, 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 we just want the steak. So they're like, would you like it? No, 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 we just want the steak. Yeah. <laughs> some Koreans are like so determined with the food. Like we're going there to eat steak. And then they tell everyone, don't eat anything. Don't order anything. Like, no, no. Like mommies are already like, no, no, no mozzarella sticks for you. No potato skin. No, no, no. We're going there for steak. Steak. <laughs> but the function of the appetizer, they are to bring up, um, to uh, stimulate your appetite for your main course. But uh, those of us who are bread lovers, like when you go to steakhouse, they give you that warm, nice, wonderful lump of carbs and you just eat it. <laughs> and when steak comes, you're like, can I have it to go? Because you just filled it with the appetizer. But the function of the appetizer is to get you start, um, uh, you know, stimulate the appetite, like salivate really, like start working your taste buds so that you're ready for the main course. So um, to appreciate the main course, the appetizers are there. They're not to fill you up, right? So like that, there is a function for it. There, is stage, there are stages to um, the purpose. And the purpose of God was to give his grace for all mankind, but for men to be ready. He had to sort of arouse and stimulate their appetite for God's grace, if you will. And that began with the first stage of grace, which is referred to as the general grace. And this general grace was given to all men, whether they believe in God or not, whether they believe the world was created or not even, whether they are atheists or not, whether they are humans or worms, dogs, all things that live and breathe and live, all living creatures benefit from this thing called generous, the general grace, because that was given by God who created the world for all living things. So we, we tend to think it's just humans, but also living things, because God blessed the living things. They still exist. The birds in the air, the fish in, in the sea, they survive. So all that was given to all living creatures, all humans, and those who receive it as not just benefiting from the so-called nature, but after receiving and enjoying it and benefiting, they say, wow, there must be a creator behind all this. 
Someone must have planned it all. Someone must have designed it all, and they receive it as grace. When they receive it as gift from the creator, God, um, then they are called the ones who receive the general grace. So worms don't know that they have been benefiting from general grace, right? Trees don't know that. And same thing for people who do not believe in the creator. But those uh, who not only benefit but accept this as the grace of God from the creator, then you call them as those who receive the general grace. And namely, these are the people of the Old Testament, the people of Israel. They certainly believe in the creator God. They believe in the promise of the creator God, uh, which is through and with the physical things in this world. Now, that came as an appetizer, if you will, for all men to be ready. Only when one believes that we have been given general create, uh, the general grace, benefiting from all things created, then we can receive the real thing, the real gift, the true, absolutely true, truly wonderful, most amazing gift. And that is the only begotten son, the one and only son, Jesus Christ. And he is given to all those who believe in him. Hallelujah. So that is called the special grace. So we have the general grace. And once one re receives this general grace, believing in the creator God who gave all things for us to benefit from and enjoy, they can then believe that the creator now had come in the flesh, in the form of man, to die in place of all men for their sins. They have then received the special grace through the Son of God, the only one and only God, the, one, uh, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Say amen if you think you receive the general grace. Amen. Yes? How many of you then have received the special grace? What do you think? Amen? amen. Um, certainly, there were men who received and confessed that they received grace from God um, throughout the history of the Bible. Sometimes receiving the grace is ex uh, expressed as finding favor in the eyes of the Lord. So a lot of people would confess that, thank you, Lord, I, if I have found favor in your eyes. Right? So thank you for your favor. Favor is not just like, do me a favor. Right? So do me a favor. So we tend to think like favor is something you do for someone else. But yes, the idea is gift. That if you find favor in someone's eyes, you have been blessed with that grace. So Noah was uh, one of such uh, people. So uh, Genesis 6, 8 uh, describes him as he who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. What was the um, outcome of having found favor in the eyes of the Lord? What did Noah get as a result? Noah received the warning about the great judgment that was coming against the whole world by the global flood. And he and his, wife, his family uh, survived, were saved from the deluge because they built the ark uh, according to God's instructions. Abram was another man who, was found, who had found uh, favor in the Lord's eyes. Genesis 18, 3, uh, when the Lord appeared with angels to his home, uh, he said, if I found favor in your eyes, please do not pass by. But come to your humble servant's home. Let me welcome you. Let me host you. So he cooked up a storm and he made butter or yogurt. I forget what he made. And I'm like, wow, so specific. Like some part of the Bible is so specific. Like what was on the menu that day? It was very specific. So he slaughtered his animals and served the Lord because he understood that it was great gift that the Lord had come to him. And as a result, he received a son at the age of 100. Do you believe that? So his name changes according to God's promise. You know, in the his name already changed even before having the son because that was foretelling about the blessing God would give him, the grace he would give him from Abram to Abraham, becoming the father of many nations, receiving a son at the age of 100. His nephew Lot was another man who confessed that he had found favor in the eyes of the Lord because he received the warning about what? The destruction of which cities? Sodom. And Gomorrah. So the angels came, and the, the, the Lord sent the angels to him and his family about the uh, coming wrath of God against the cities, which would happen the next morning. And because of that, Lot and his family ran. And even at that point, God had instructed him to go somewhere farther, but because he had asked the Lord, if, the, if I have found favor in your eyes, I'm too old. I cannot run that fast. I cannot go that far. Could I go somewhere else that's nearby and then let your destruction take place? And the Lord said, yes. 
So he received God's grace that way. And certainly from then came the people of Israel who received favor, who, was, who had found favor in the Lord's eyes. For God remembered his promise to their ancestor Abraham and brought them out of their slavery in Egypt after being there for four generations. So the exodus took place as a result of God's grace for their people. So God chose the people of Israel among the many, and then um, he, to make them his people, he gave them the law after they left Egypt. So in the desert, before they entered the promised land, God gave them commandment. So the commandment that they received uh, was conditional. It's a con- contract. It was a contract. If they obey the commandment, what were they blessed? Uh, th- what were they promised? They were promised many blessings, right? So physical blessings. Uh, in Deuteronomy 7, 13 says, He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb. Fruit of your womb, meaning children. So your children will not get harmed. You're, you will have many children and your children have many, many, many. Your people will not become extinct. Your people will not be harmed. Your people will survive. That's what that blessing is for. Not only them, but also the, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, and olive oil, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks, and the land, they will be given to you, and they will be many. So what they owned, they were promised to be multiplied and be secured. So did this sound good? And God said, Deuteronomy 5.10, that he will show his love to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. So they said yes, and they did all their best to keep the commandments of the Lord. In case they forgot, they were commanded to build an object, a building in their midst to remind them. What was this structure? Called the sanctuary, first in the form of a tabernacle in the desert, and then later the building, the permanent building called the Temple of Jerusalem later. When the when Moses built the... Um, tabernacle in the desert in Exodus chapter 25, the building started with an unusual object. Usually when you build a house or building, what do you start with? The foundation, the ground. That's the the, the most challenging, the most important work. And so that's why you see a construction site, but you don't see anything for a long time because they're doing all the work underground and on the underground and underground. But this place is really odd because the first object God told them to make, anyone know? was the ark. It's like, can you make a table first and then we'll build a house? Almost like that, right? So it's really odd if you think about it. The ark of covenant or the ark of the testimony was the first object that they were to make. What was inside of it? The stone tablets that had the commandment of God. They were placed in there. And then later on, they were also reminded that the name of the Lord God was in there. What was the name of the Lord God the people of Israel believed? Jehovah. Yes, Jehovah was the name that God revealed to the people of Israel in the Old Testament through the angel. So that name was inside that ark. On top of the ark was a covering, a piece of wood, uh, and everything was overlaid with pure gold. So that was called the atonement cover or the mercy seat. Altogether, what's it called? What's it called the top? The mercy seat. So the mercy seat functioned as the foundation of the sanctuary. It was also the purpose of of the sanctuary, it was also the heart, the core of the sanctuary. The three things that I said about the mercy seat. What, did, what was its function? It was the foundation, it was the purpose, and its heart, its core. So the core of the sanctuary was the mercy seat. What happened on the mercy seat? It's called the mercy seat, but did anybody sit on that thing? Nobody sat on that thing. It was called the atonement cover because this is where the priest would bring the atoning sacrifice blood. So when the blood was poured or brought there, God met with the people through the high priest. How many times a year? Once a year. And it was where their sin as a people would be atoned for. This is Yom Kippur. So that this is the holiday, the day of atonement, where they would bring the blood to be atoned for their sin. And that would happen at the top of the ark. From there, God would receive the blood to atone their sins. That's what was called the mercy seat. Do you understand now? Wow, you're, 
You didn't even register for Logos, and I'm teaching you this for free. Yes? Hallelujah. All right? God's grace. Okay. So the mercy seed was to remind them of God's grace, in plain words. The mercy seed was God's grace. So keep that in mind. The sanctuary was about the mercy seed. Mercy seed was about God's grace to show that the grace of God. It begins with the grace of God and ends with the grace of God. By the grace of God, they were set free as a people, delivered from their slavery through the Passover lamb's blood. And then they were brought out and continually for thousands of years, for generations, as long as they obeyed the commandment and they gave, they gave blood, a sacrifice to atone their sins, God showed mercy to them. They were forgiven. Later on, when Solomon builds the temple of Jerusalem in Jerusalem, like solid building, everything was furnished with new. Because when, when you build a new place, everything is new, right? What would you want to bring your old furniture for? All the Ikea stuff, you'll like break it. <laughs> It breaks anyway. After a while, you know that. It's like <laughs> all that, like, press board stuff. It doesn't last that long. So all, all this stuff. You go into a mansion, right? You, babe, you build a mansion. You're not going to lug your college dorm uh, furniture from Ikea. But you're going, not, not that there's anything wrong with Ikea. I like Ikea. But I'm just saying. So if you go to, like, a multi-million mansion, you're not going to bring the old furniture. You're going to give it away, donate, or sell, whatever. And you buy brand new stuff. You build brand new stuff, right? So that's what was happening with King uh, Solomon's temple. However, as First King chapter 7, uh, uh, 48 to 50 indicates, everything was made new except one item. Can you guess which item was kept? The ark, the mercy seat. Huh, why is that, right? So everything was built new except the original ark with the mercy seat. That Moses in the desert made continued on to the temple of Jerusalem. Why? Because the mercy of God, the grace of God that began will continue and end. So that was for the people to remember that they were called by God's grace to become God's people and it was his grace. In Joshua, let's look at uh, together, in, book of, in the book of Joshua, chapter 11, 20, for it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. So this is about Joshua leading the people of Israel and you know, fighting against the neighboring tribes because when Joshua led the people into the promised land, the promised land was occupied already for generations by all the people who'd been there all along. So now the people of uh, Israel, children of Israel going in there and say, this is our land, get out. They're not going to get out. So they have to engage uh, into, in, in war. So that's what he's saying. But what the Lord is saying about destroying these enemies was he himself, right? It was the Lord himself who will harden their hearts to wage war against Israel. So the Lord is him, himself involved, intervening in the warfare and making it hard for the people of Israel by hardening their enemies' hearts. And then he might destroy them totally later on. So it's the Lord who's hardening hearts. It's the Lord who's destroying the enemies. It is, it's the Lord who's giving mercy. It's the Lord who's giving his wrath. So some of you are going like, no thanks. I don't want that kind of Lord. Because some people start with the Bible. They're like, all right, all right, I'll Try out the Bible. Okay, so you invited me to church. You're nice people, so I'll try reading the Bible. So then they start reading the Bible. It's like Garden of Eden, the serpent, Adam. All right. So they kind of read, and then they come to the story of Noah's, Noah and the flood. It's like, what? God, who is loving, who is gracious, destroy the whole world and only let Noah and his family live? No, thanks. And they shut the book. Or I was like, no, just give it a try. Just keep reading. It's like... <sighs> okay, let me just keep reading. And they keep reading, and they find parts like that. The Lord himself will harden their hearts and then destroy them. Destroy totally. It's like, what? This is the Lord who loves? This is the Lord who is gracious, who is merciful? I don't want that, Lord. No thanks. But we have to understand, the Lord is not what we make him out to be. As I've said before, he's not Santa Claus. Many people think God is like Santa Claus, like a guy that we show up with a wish list when we need him, and when we don't need him, we tuck him away in a closet and forget about him whole year. That's not who God is. God has his plan. He has his free will, his emotion, his intelligence. He is God a person. He's a personal God. We need to know him, therefore, according to how he revealed himself, and that is through the word of the Bible. Amen? Whether you like it or not. 
it's, it is what it is. It is the way God revealed himself. So God says, I am the one who gives favor. I am the one who takes away favor. I am the one who gives grace to whom I want. And I am the one who takes away. So if there is absence of God's grace, then it's his wrath, his curse. If there's absence of his blessing, it's curse. It's destruction. So that was the repeated history of Israel because, in fact, the people of Israel who said, amen, we'll obey the law. Amen, for thousands of generations, we will receive your blessing. Amen, as a result of obedience to your law, we're going to be blessed in our wound and our crops and blah, blah, blah. But as they settled and lived in, uh, in the midst of the Gentiles, they started marrying their women. They started uh, bringing their cu uh, customs, and they started also worshiping their idols and their gods. So they, had, uh, they forsook God's grace and face God's wrath as a result. However, there was the prophecy that God made through Isaiah in chapter 61, verse 2, that he will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. In Zechariah 8, 22, it says, And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. So there was prophecy of someone coming to Jerusalem, and through him, the day of the Lord's salvation, his favor would come. Who do you think the prophecy was about? Yeshua, the Son of God, Jesus, coming in the name of the Father, Yeshua, which is Jesus in English, but Yeshua in Aramaic, the Savior, he was born and given that name according to prophecy, and as he walked by that very temple, what did he say? He said, Let's go to John 2, 19, verse 18, 2, 18. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous signs can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he has spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So they're asking, what signs do you have to claim yourself to be the Messiah, to, the, to be the Son of God? And Yeshua's response standing before the temple was, destroy this temple, meaning you destroy it, and I'll raise it again in three days. Now, they heard it as speaking, Jesus speaking of the building. So they couldn't fathom, how long did this temple take to build? It says 46 years, and this is not the building that Solomon had built. The building that Solomon had, had built was destroyed and, and later was, like, uh, edified and repaired and so on. And then this, the one that Jesus walked by and spoke, was looking at, this temple for, taking 46 years was built by the king Herod, which was much bigger too. So it was an impressive uh, structure, and the Jews took pride of, of that. And not only that, they were reverent of the place. Because remember, what did the temple represent? Uh-oh, you forgot already? The mercy seat, the grace of God. Without it, they received no mercy from God. They received no grace from God. Without it, they would be destroyed. So even as, as they uh, had forsaken God's grace and they walked away from him, when they repented and came back to God, gave offering to him, sac made sacrifice, made atonement for their sins, they were forgiven. So they believed. So they were able to do this because of the mercy seat of the temple. Without it, therefore, they would not be forgiven. They would have absolutely no hope for God's grace. So when Yeshua said this, they took it as blasphemy as well as hopelessness. So that's why they were upset. The Jews saying, how dare you say that? And later on, when the, uh, when the Jews conspired, especially under the leadership of the Pharisees and the chief priests, they said, you said about the temple, we are... Put it, we are judging you and handing you over to the Romans because you, what you said about the temple. You claim yourself to be God and how you challenged God through, about the temple, through the temple. But what Yeshua was referring to only after he did die and resurrect, the disciples recall, was about the temple of his body. Altogether, his death. And in three days, his? So he was prophesying. He said, you will put me to death, but I will be risen back to life through my resurrection my death and my resurrection, I'm going to reveal to you the grace of God, the true grace of God that is not about blessing the, the fruit of your womb and crops of your land, which may sound good, but they're not eternal. They're not perfect. Now coming in the Father's name, as John 5, 43 says, the Father's name being Yeshua, coming in that name, 
Not in the name of Jehovah given to the people of Israel only by the angel, but now coming in the Father's name, the name Yeshua, he will lay down his life and give his life, his own body, his own blood as sacrifice to make atonement sin for not just for the people of Israel for one year, but for all people, once for all, for eternity. Hallelujah. So that we will know the true grace of God the amazing grace of God, that we will be able to know it, receive it without a price. That was the purpose of sending the Son of God to the world in the flesh of man. But when Yeshua said, let's keep in mind, he said, destroy the temple. And he didn't say, let's keep it destroyed. He said, destroy it. I will raise it back again. I will raise it again. Meaning, you still need the temple. Remember, what does a temple Represent the mercy seed, the grace of God. So destroying it is not the only thing he was going to do. He's going to raise it back because, remember, the foundation of the temple, the purpose of the temple, the heart of the temple was the mercy seed, the grace of God, and now the grace of God has come. Now, if you think about that, in the Greek word, the mercy seed, um, like in Hebrews 9, 5, talks about the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Because the way the ark was structured, if you haven't seen it, at least if you saw Indiana Jones, the first one. Maybe you remember the picture of the, <laughs> the ark. So there was the, the, the cherubim, like Im- uh, figurines of uh, angels' wings covering the mercy seat. So that's describing that in the book of Hebrews 9, 5. It talks about the mercy seat being overshadowed by the wings of the cherubim, the angels. That mercy seat in Greek is... Um, to hilasterion. So to hilasterion is the word for the mercy seat, atonement cover. But when you look at Romans 3.25, which we looked at last week uh, greatly, and when we talked about the law of faith and justification, I brought in the word propitiation, which you're going to read in, like, in the English uh, standard version, ESV, but in the NIV it doesn't use that word. NIV uses like very watered-down word. It sounds nice, but... The word propitiation is to to propitiate means to make atonement, and it's closer to the original text. But there, uh, Jesus came as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's Romans 3.25. The word mercy seat in English and the word propitiation in English may sound different, but in Greek, they're both saying ho um, hilasterion, which means the mercy seat. So what I'm trying to say is, The word for the mercy seat and atonement is the same because that's where atonement takes place. So the mercy seat is where one, uh, the place of propitiation. The mercy seat is where you atone for sins. I've already said it, but by knowing that the writer of the Bible uses the same Greek word is to understand who that mercy seat is. When Jesus said destroy it, I'll raise it again in three days. He was talking about the temple of his body. The core of the temple is the mercy seat, the mercy seat where atonement is made, the atoning sacrifice, the mercy seat, the grace of God is Yeshua. Hallelujah. Do you understand? To Hilasterion is Yeshua. The mercy seat is Yeshua because the mercy seat is the grace of God coming in the flesh of man. Do you understand? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to John 1, 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The word was with God in the beginning. And verse 3 says, through him All things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made. So the word, through the word, all things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made. So the word, in fact, was the one who gave that general grace to all mankind, the one who made all things, so that men be ready, their appetite be ready for the true gift of God. And that grace, God, the grace of the gracious God, the God of grace, who revealed himself as the gracious God through the mercy seat, but only for the people, the chosen people of Israel, now had come in the flesh of man. Verse 14 says, 114, the word became flesh 
made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Hallelujah. So there, if you look at verse 16 then, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. In an earlier text, it says one, from one grace after another. One blessing from one blessing another. One grace from another. So blessing from another. That is talking about there's a grace there first, and then another grace comes. So meaning the general grace is given first, and then the special grace through the one and only Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because now he has come, not to the people, only one people on earth, to give them physical blessing as a result of his grace, but now to all men in Adam, for the souls of all men, to forgive their sins through his own body. So First Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. He himself, Hebrews 10, 5 says, a body you prepare for me. A body that the Father, God, the God of grace prepared for himself was the body that was the word. Who is the word? The word was God. The word is the creator. The word who made the world became body to bear our sins himself. In the Old Testament, God never bore the sins of men. They did it through animal sacrifice. But it was neither perfect nor eternal. That's why they had to do it all the time. And still the guilt from their sin remained in their conscience. But here is the word becoming flesh, the incarnate word, the word becoming flesh and blood, so that through him, his own body, that himself, he himself, who knows no sin, knows no, no shame, knows no suffering, knows no, no death, would become sin and die to be torn and spilled out to propitiate as the mercy seat that he himself will become the atoning sacrifice and the mercy seat at the same time to forgive the sins of men so that they may know the true grace of God hallelujah so when it was time for him to die he did not refuse but he went to the cross willingly when he died what did he say however he said it is finished he cried out, it is finished, because it was the moment that he laid on his life willingly according to the Father's command. Let's keep in mind that his death was not a suicidal move. He, as some people thought, was he going to kill himself? Because when they heard him going, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, he's going to go to a place where you cannot come. So they thought, maybe he's going to kill himself. He did not kill himself. He died in the hands of men, and it was a result of him using the authority to lay down his life, as John 10, 18 says. This was according to the Father's command. Jesus said, my father has given me this command and I'm going to do it willingly lay down my life so that I can use the authority to take up my life again according to the command according to the prophecy that he's going to be destroyed but will be raised back to life again hallelujah only then he will receive the grace of the father even though we distinguish him from the father and say he's the son he's the father he is God he is nature is God he knows no sin He's the part of God who was planned to be manifested, to become flesh. However, because he became flesh, when he was in flesh, he came as, as the one who would do the work as the son of God who makes plan, that the will of God, the plan of God is greater than himself. So he submitted willingly to the plan of the father and to say, Father, you truly are the gracious God. For your grace, to reveal your grace, you did not spare me, your son. So you let me die willingly like this. It was the father to become the father of grace, the God of grace for all men to know. And for the son to also receive that grace that the father prepared for him, which is in Hebrews 1-2. It says the father appointed him 
to become the heir of all things. Hallelujah! That for him all things were made. Colossians 1 16. All things visible, invisible, all things were made and prepared for the Son. And only when he laid down his life willingly, considering his life nothing, but even that point he will receive it as grace. Father, I have received your favor, your kindness. As the prophecy in Psalm 141, 5 says, let a righteous man strike me. This is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. Even if I'm rebuked, even if I'm killed, even though I know no sin, I become sin. I know it as the grace of the Father. Hallelujah! And through his death, he condemned the ungrateful one, the devil, the archangel, who sinned in the beginning, caused Adam to sin. And by... Shedding his precious blood, he redeemed the sins of all mankind. Hallelujah. First Peter 2.24 and Ephesians 1.7 saying, we have redemption. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption through his blood. All together, redemption through his blood. Redeemed by his blood. Redeemed by his grace. And the result is the forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. Not that we have done anything for it, but because of his grace. He's done it once for all. So that whosoever comes to him, whosoever believes, will be forgiven, will be saved. Hallelujah. He did die. Completely he died. However, in three days, the father raised him back to life. And Yeshua resurrected. And after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven. He sat down on the throne of heaven. And that throne is called the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16 talks about that. The throne of grace. Revelation 22, 1-2 describes this throne in heaven. The throne of God. There's the throne of God and throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb. From there comes the river of the water of life. The river of the water of life flowing from this throne and it is coming down to reach all the trees along the river to let them bear fruit bearing 12 crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month so this water brings life to whoever whatever it touches the water that is coming down from the throne of God is the grace of God to this day from that moment on flows the grace of God hallelujah so that you and I today even 2,000 years later on whosoever hears the great news of God's grace can receive the effect of his redemptive work that is the forgiveness of sin and receive the promise of eternal life hallelujah how many of you receive this good news it has come by the Holy Spirit the good news the gospel is not that you believe Jesus and the fruit of your womb will be blessed or the cross of your lamb will be blessed or your bank account will grow. That's not the grace of God. That is not the good news that you have come to hear. But the good news is the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That he who knows no sin became sin for you. The righteous becoming unrighteous so that by his grace, you may be redeemed, forgiven, cleansed, and given life. Hallelujah. Say amen if you receive this gospel. That you welcome the grace of God. Say amen. amen. How have you received it? It's by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, grace who comes from the throne of grace. And he comes in the name of Yeshua. And he comes to those who have called upon the name of Yeshua. When you call in the name Yeshua. Let's say together, Yeshua. And it is not just shouting Yeshua, but to believe that that is the name of your Savior, as the name means. You see, all the sermons that you've been hearing from the first week of January, we started from the very broad idea of what being a man means and human means, what this body is made of, and that we are created. We are sinners, yet we have been justified. And now we are receiving God's grace. So each theme is the stage of receiving the grace, the gospel of his grace. But each message has its own point. Do you understand? 
So for you to get here, we have to talk about how God, he made us, how he made us. There's a maker, there's a planner, designer, how we are made, what we are meant to be. Yet because we are sinners, Adam sinned, our ancestors sinned, we inherit the original sin, but we can't just blame that guy. We also sin. We breathe in and uh, in out sin. We know sin like fish knows water. Do you understand? Not like, well, I'm not that bad. But that's why we talked about justification being legal, lawful in the eyes of God and lawless, unlawful in the eyes of God. It's one or the other. Perhaps you think out of the 613 points of the law, maybe I broke like one or two. So don't I pass? Am I not good enough? But when you talk about the judgment of God, the judgment of his righteousness, unless you're declared lawful, you're doomed. So all men are left silenced in their sin, waiting for their destruction in hell. But here's the grace of God coming, given without a price. Why without a price? Not because it's cheap, not because it's nothing, but because it's too costly. As Acts 20:28 20, says, by the blood of God, you have been purchased. The blood of God. Who is God? The God who made the heavens and the earth, the God who placed the planets in their places and they're still going in their orbit for thousands of years, tens of thousands. They've been still there. They've been there since the day he commanded them to be. He who made me became like me. He himself bore my sins unto his body. He who hates sin, he has nothing to do with sin, bore my sins unto his body. So in the eyes of God, he was sin at the moment when he died on the cross. So that the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the judgment of the righteousness would be satisfied once for all. So that there's no more price, no more penalty to be paid. Hallelujah. That's what he has done for us. To know this, the Holy Spirit preaches to this day like the river coming from the throne, flowing endlessly, the grace of God. He lets us know so that we may grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as 2 Peter 3.18 says. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. For us to receive his grace, like receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the answers to our prayers. Say amen if you believe you receive the grace of God. It's the forgiveness of his sin and by his blood. Say amen. Say amen if you have received the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have experienced receiving answers to prayer. Healing. Amen. But it all comes in stages, you see. So you can't just show up with somebody that you brought for the first time who knows nothing about the word of God, nothing about God, nothing about Jesus, and say, Pastor, this person is really sick. Can you pray for them? Is it possible? What do you think? With God, isn't everything possible? Of course all things are possible with God. But there is something called faith and grace he does not surpass the faith in his grace he does not surpass he works with faith so you need to have faith that received his grace only then your prayers will be answered only then you will receive the power of the holy spirit only then you will experience healing freedom from all cursed sickness in your body amen so we need to start with the grace of god so you hear at the end of every sermon Every, sir, at the end of every service, there and here, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the, you don't pay attention to this part because you're going, I'm going to go eat bagel right now. <laughs> Do you understand? The last prayer, people are going, I, I got to go to the bathroom and clean the toilet. I got to go and run and prepare my meeting and get the bagel. The end of the service ends on this benediction which is a prayer. 
uh, that sends out the congregation back to the world with the blessing of God. And it starts with, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Usually the tr they're there, the Trinity, the triune, God is mentioned, the three persons of God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And usually we say in that order, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. As Jesus said, I send you out to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them, in the, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Because this is the way he revealed himself historically and made relationship with us. Doesn't mean that's the rank. Because when you look at it, the benediction, which comes, comes from 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it starts with the Son, the grace of the Son. Why? Only when you receive the grace of Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ, then you can receive the Father's love all the days of your life. His protection, his blessing, the answers to his prayer, starting with his forgiveness. What Jesus, the Son, did was redemption. But the forgiveness of sin comes as a result of my faith in his redemption. And the one who forgives my sin is the Father. Do you understand? The one who redeemed my sin was the Son who came in the flesh. When I believe in that, the Father forgives my sin. So it is the, the Father's love I can receive as a result of receiving the blood of the Son, the blood of Yeshua, the grace of Yeshua. Hallelujah. It is starting with his blood. Only then the Holy Spirit comes in such souls to let them grow in the knowledge of his, knowing his grace. The knowledge of knowing his grace. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you don't know just grace, that one day that you heard the gospel and you say, I prayed and God answered my prayer, I received God's grace. I like to say, you just had a bowl of salad that's your appetizer working up to the main course. Because I do encourage people who don't believe in the existence of God, they have to experience God's living existence. So I say, start praying. Pray for anything. And even if it's sort of like laughable, thing that they pray for, but they say, i feel like I've been answered, then that's good because they're now starting to open their minds and their hearts to experience the living God. But that is not the special grace, the true grace that God wants to give. Or some people say, and I've met people coming through MMC from here too. It's like, yeah, I want to learn English and I want to learn Western culture, the American culture. That's why I want to come to church. A person told me that literally. I, was, I said, okay. <laughs> It's better than not wanting to come, right? <laughs> so there's a, you know, now we go away with our old Eastern culture, Eastern religion, like Buddhism, Hinduism, we throw it away, and now we're in America. Let's believe in American God. <laughs> I mean, at least that was a painting that I grew up with. The painting that we had in our house when we were young was a painting of Jesus in blonde, with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I thought that's how Jesus looked. And then later I was like, wait a minute, he was Jew. Blonde, blue eyed, who did that? Yeah, so that's how I thought Jesus looked. It doesn't matter what you imagine him to be, that's human imagination. What we need to know is his grace, that he is the God who knows no sin, who became sin on our behalf, who poured out his blood to forgive us by making atonement for our sin. The mercy seat he propitiated in my, on my behalf so that I can be saved today. Hallelujah. So receiving grace is knowing that according to the law, that I am condemned 100% as a sinner, therefore having to pay the price of my sin in hell. How many of you really believe that? You confess that you're a sinner, meaning you confess that you deserve nothing but the fire of hell. Do you understand that? It's not like I feel a little bad because I'm not perfect. I'm a little lazy. I yelled at my mom this morning and I feel bad. You know, I have room to grow. You know, I have to be a better worker. I yell at my boss and I curse at work. That's not a confession of being a sinner. As soon as you say, I'm a sinner, it means I deserve hell. I have to go to hell for my sin, for my many sins. But because Jesus, who is the one who made the world, He's the creator. He was not some good leader, a good guy who died for his followers. He's not human. He's not sinner. He's not dust. But he is God, the word in the beginning who became flesh. Who had the function, the 
ability to die by dying on our behalf with our sin, with my sin on his body. And he paid the price of sin, satisfying the demand of the law, the demand of the righteous God. Hallelujah. And by simply believing, believing in my heart and confessing with my mouth, I have been justified, been saved, been forgiven. Now I know his grace. And through the Holy Spirit, who searches the deepest in my heart, who searches the deepest in my heart. The Holy Spirit in me is like the searchlight. The searchlight is so bright that you cannot hide from the searchlight. Even in the darkest place where there's no other lamp, all the more. The cop's light can see a lot, everything. Twitching of a muscle. No, nothing in my trunk. Yeah, he sees. But it's the searchlight. So... Search life from above, from front, back. That's the Holy Spirit inside of me. That even if no one knows about what I have done, whether in my past or as recent as last night or in my dreams, the Holy Spirit inside of me makes me convicted, reminds me of what I am. Remember, you did that. That was your past. You went back to it. How could you? After what, you, what Jesus has done for you, you're still doing that. And you say, you know his grace. So he's still convicting in my heart. Therefore, when I go back to his cross, when I cling onto the cross of his grace, his forgiving grace, his saving grace, his grace becomes deeper, wider, higher, greater than ever before. Hallelujah. That was the experience and the confession of the Apostle Paul. Circumcised at the age of eight. Day eight. He kept the law from childhood unto adulthood. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. A teacher of the law. He was a scholar of many bodies of knowledge. He was blameless according to the law. So if he, if he himself says, and he does in 1 Corinthians 15 as we, where we read... He was perfect according to the law of God, the law of Moses. Until he heard the voice of the Lord on his way to Damascus. Now, who was Paul? He was a zealot. He was a religious, zealous Jew for the Jewish God. Practicing the Jewish law. And he thought that he was doing what the Lord wanted him to do by persecuting the Christians. People were afraid of Paul. They were scared of Paul because they knew what kind of man he was. He was a mean, mean guy. Forever, he reminded others and he reminded himself, I was a persecutor of the church. He bore that pain all his life, never forgetting that he's a sinner. Because up until hearing the voice of the Lord, he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. But once he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Saul, Saul, as his former name was, why do you persecute me? And he fell and he realized, who are you? Who are you? I am Jesus. I am Yeshua. When he heard that voice, he had lost his sight. For days to come after that, he fell into deep, deep reflection, painful reflection and repentance looking at all his life just completely shattering the world that he thought that he knew the faith he knew the righteousness he knew now was nothing so writing the book of Romans in chapter 7 coming to the conclusion the good I know that I should do this good I don't do but the evil I do not want to do this I keep on doing what a wretched man I am what a wretch I am who will save me from this body of destruction thanks be to God it is through my Savior our Savior our salvation Yeshua hallelujah for him to come to the confession that he's a wretch, the worst of all sinners, it was by the 
power of the spirit of grace who let him grow in knowing the grace of God. It is not just to be moved and say, Jesus, I feel very bad for you. You died on the cross for all those hours you suffered. And you seem like a good guy and you died for me, such a bad guy. No, it's more than that. Yeshua is not man like us. He knows no sin. He did not, not commit sin because he has strong willpower. But because he is God, he has nothing to do with sin, nothing to do with shame, nothing to do with suffering and death. Yet by coming as man. He endured them all to fulfill and reveal the grace of God. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit lets us know that it is by his grace that we have been forgiven this way, that we have been justified freely, that we have been promised to become the heirs of God, as Romans 8, uh, 4, 16 and 8 also uh, explains. So if we have received the grace of God, we consider all things as the grace of God. The fact that we have been called to be here today, to be called to know him, to be called. That calling out from darkness, out from hopelessness, out from a sinful life. I've been called out. I was once blind. I was once lost. But now I am found. Now I see. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Hallelujah. So he lets us know that the fact that we receive the word of grace as Paul continued to confess that he would not hold back his life, that he considered his life worth nothing. In light of the task that he was called to complete, and that is to testify the gospel of God's grace. That even though he knew in Acts 20, he talks about that as he writes to the elders in Ephesus, that every city waits for him with persecution. That he is going to be chained and he's going to die. But he will not hold back, he will not shrink back. Because he was compelled by the spirit to complete the task of testifying about the Lord Yeshua to test to finish the task of testifying the God the gospel of God's grace he considered his life worth nothing because the word that he received it was the word of grace many gifts that one receives we consider them as grace answers to our prayers the gift of tongues the gift of healing gift of service the faith the body of Christ to which we belong. This is his gift. This is his grace. Without the church, without church of Jesus, many of us here, I think all can say, where would I be today? Where would I be today? Because it was through the church of Jesus I have heard the gospel of his grace. I have been I have been forgiven. I have heard the news that I've been redeemed. I've been forgiven. I've been cleansed. I've been saved by his grace. And it was through someone who preached to me and who brought me here. And I am just drowned and spoiled even in the word of grace. Hallelujah. It is all his grace. Amen. Those who have this confession can also say, Who can be against us? Who can condemn us? No one can take away this grace from me. For I have truly experienced the grace of God. And if you have this confession, this faith, then you will be able to take up your cross to follow him. Even if if the path is narrow and difficult and lonely. Whatever hardship or persecution may come, whatever sickness, 
Sometimes the Lord will bring on hardship, challenge for me through disease, through troubles in relationship and troubles financially or whatever situation that you may be struggling in now. The Lord put, the, put them there to test you, to make you stronger, to, for you to know his grace all the more. And even if you're going through such hard time, you say, thank you, Lord. It is by your grace. I am what I am today. Many of you heard Pastor Kang's testimony about how he, she was miraculously healed from a disease that she suffered from 10, 13 years of her life. And because of she opened her eyes, opened her minds to the living God. Then when she heard the gospel, she realized what a sinner she was that she is, and she truly received the grace of God. And there was no turning back from then on. She was unstoppable, evangelizing and preaching and living a dream. But because my dad and our family were coming to New York, and then she just could not hold out anymore, her pastor in Korea had to send her off as a missionary and say, you go and do the work of God in New York. Go ahead. We bless you. When she was sent, she was sent with no support, no people, no financial help, but just herself. And looking back, she said she was resentful because she was so sad. And you couldn't blame her. She lived such a dreamy life, being saved, healed, walking on clouds. Even as she was persecuted, even if she didn't have anything on her, she had the grace of God moving her, saving souls and teaching them, making disciples. She was so happy. And then now she was sent off without anyone, no longer living their life, now to become independent on her own, herself leading the flock. Even that was very difficult. For many years until the church of Jesus is found. And even those years to this day, definitely not without challenges. But I remember some years ago when she preached this message, she said, now I look back. Those moments that I was very sad and I even resented becoming a pastor and being a founding pastor to lead a church. And she said, Why? I don't want to pastor. I don't want to be doing this. I want to be just a regular follower, an evangelist, a witness for you. I was so happy doing that. But she realized that without being the pastor and leading and preaching, she would not know Jesus the way she does today. That she would not know the word as she does today. And she has absolutely no regret about that. Hearing that testimony really moved me <laughs> because I myself had no plan on becoming pastor. I don't want to be part of a pastor's family, never wanted to marry a pastor, never wanted to be a pastor. No more pastor's life. And even now, I feel the pressing in my chest at times, thinking about the burden of the unknown future, if you will. But whatever the future may bring, I think of now. And even though I have so many regrets of the past, and I say, I wish I can go back and change my past. I wish I had done right thing in the eyes of God. I wish I had not done that. I wish I had done this instead. Even this morning, I was beating my chest, <laughs> repenting that. But one thing that I don't ever want to change, one thing that I can never regret is knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing who Yeshua is as a result of preaching this name, Yeshua, and preaching this word of grace. Because I know him now, like I've never known before, that I never want to change. Even if it comes at a highest cost, I don't ever want to exchange 
the knowledge of knowing his grace. Because I know his grace. By the grace of God, I had the opportunity to teach in Europe and start English ministry in 2009 and starting Europe ministry in 2008. With the completion of Logos USA 8 this year, I would have taught Logos 18 times. 18 times in 10 years. I consider that as greatest honor and the greatest grace because I know it that much more. And I want to boast this grace all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Close our eyes. Ask yourself, do I know the grace of God? Do you know the grace of God? The amazing grace of God that saved the wretch like you? No, it's more than my life was sad. I was struggling with depression, but now I'm happy because I'm with these nice people. It's more than that. It's more than answer, receiving answer to your prayers. It's more than Yeshua making your life fuller than before. It's Yeshua saving you from the fire of hell. Do you know that grace? If you know that grace, you would consider all things as His grace. Giving thanks and boasting and sharing the word of grace, testifying God's grace, the gospel of His grace. Let's raise our hands to heaven where our Lord of grace is seated on that mercy seat. He